let's be honest here. If you choose to live a life in the public eye, especially as an entertainer, there's going to be people who try to dig up information on you. All those Wikipedia articles that detail a celebrity's life story down to the vital statistics don't just materialize from thin air. This information is often shared actively by the celebrity, but sometimes excavated by devoted fans or the media. And that, specifically, is what makes this musician in today's video so special and interesting. Upon looking at their Wikipedia article, I was surprised to find the words undisclosed under where the birth name typically lies. Even their own face on album covers and in live performances was intentionally undisclosed. Always obscured with glasses and long curly hair. It's not even known if their hair was real or a wig, that's how little we know about the actual person. Their clothes were also very loose and masculine, as though they did not want to be identified at all, identified by nothing other than their musical talent, that is. That and the stage name they chose for themselves. The name they allowed Japan to refer to them as, Doji Morita. And really, that's all that was needed. Morita's music speaks for itself. The music presented made a statement. It was grim and macabre, speaking to topics typically unsaid in the Japan they performed for. These topics felt real and concrete, as though Morita had truly been through tragedy and hardship in their life. Though, the details of Morita's life was just as unknown as their face. How did keeping such a private life benefit them? Were there any repercussions? And did any personal details get revealed in the 50 plus years following their debut? Well, let's explore that. Today, we're talking about the life of Doji Morita, Japan's darkest musician. The birthplace of Morita has been the source of speculation for many years. Even that isn't truly known. According to dedicated fans, the birthplace of Morita is one of two places. Within the city of Tokyo, or somewhere within Aomori Prefecture in the year 1952. The Aomori theory supposedly comes from promotional material passed out at a 1980 concert. This promotional material being a pamphlet given out during the concert that shared tidbits about Morita as a person. This was one of the very few documents that actually did. Beyond time and place of birth, there are some other aspects of Morita's life that are a bit more concrete. Those being the documented drive behind becoming a musician. Simmer down to two events in their life. Their involvement in school protests in the late 1960s and the later death of a close friend in the early 1970s. And in order to better understand this time period, it's time for a brief Japanese history lesson. The late 1960s school protests that Morita referenced involvement in were likely the Japanese university protests of 1968 and 1969. These protests, often escalating and becoming riots, were a massive event in post-war Japan. At its peak, 41% of students had refused to attend class and were instead joining in actions of protest and activism, forming organized protest groups referred to as Zen Kyoto. But what were they protesting exactly? An overabundance of grievances, actually, ranging from personal to political. Really, the issue protested often varied greatly from school to school as each university had their own issues they were protesting. The biggest topics of outrage included dismay at the cost of tuition, internships that failed to pay students for their hard work, equality to female students, and a general disagreement with the Vietnam War and the actions being taken regarding it at the time. The students' method of protest was often forceful and often escalated to acts of violence. There was a lot of outrage that fueled this time in Japanese history, and all the reasons behind said upset had been piling on for decades. These university protests eventually got so bad that they required government intervention. Multiple universities were literally seized by their own student body. And due to said government intervention, these protests eventually stopped and were completely ceased by the year 1970. 
Different groups did come about in the wake of these protests, however, most notably the Women's Liberation Movement, a group that would pave the way for Japanese women's rights leading into the 1980s. And that concludes my little history lesson. It really is important to identify the time period Morita lived in so that we can better understand their music and motivation behind it. This was a time when post-war Japan was rapidly transforming. Following their involvement in these protests, likely when only a teenager and in high school, Morita made the decision to not continue their own educational career, reportedly dropping out in the year 1970. It's unknown what Morita did in the years following, that is, until the summer of 1972. That was when a young Morita, likely in their early 20s, had experienced the loss of their close friend. That 1980 concert pamphlet that we previously mentioned, titled A Rough Sketch of Doji Morita, once again revealed this detail. Morita was already unhappy with the struggles they faced with education, and the passing of their friend made them linger on the thought of how short-lived and fleeting youth truly is. The friend's name was never specified, no details were given beyond the fact that they had passed on, though this event is noted as what finally pushed Morita to enter the music scene, with a unique darkness and sense of melancholy that had yet to be seen before. It was almost three years later, in 1975, when Morita made their quiet yet sudden debut with their very first single, ironically called Goodbye, as well as the single Sayonara Boku no Tomodachi. As one may expect, the titular song on both the single and album discussed the passing of Morita's friend. That Sunday morning when my friends got caught, staggering within the rain. You've shown me kindness since then. You've changed since then. Goodbye, my friend. You, the quiet one with the beard. In the room you never came home to. Your toothbrush and your coat. Your toothbrush and your coat are still here. Goodbye, my friend. In an era of Japan quickly taken by kaiokyoku, or western-inspired popular music, Morita's unique underground image was a juxtaposition to say the least. While they did not achieve massive stardom and renown, they began collecting a dedicated following, listeners who appreciated the rawness of their music rather than a visual spectacle, marketed image, or pretty face. The professional career of Morita can be described as underground and modest. While they partook in multiple interviews, the information shared was focused on their music and vision in their art, never really delving into them as a person. The image Morita possessed remained constant throughout their career, large circular glasses obscuring their eyes, thick curly hair obscuring the remainder of their face. Their choice of dress was intentionally androgynous. They used phrasing that was not entirely masculine nor feminine. Subtle things like this added to Morita's anonymous image. 1975's Goodbye was only the beginning of their career, and if I said Doji Morita didn't have a following after entering the music industry on a professional level, well, I'd be lying. Much like how people flock to the works of Osamu Dazai for their unique take on dismal and joyless topics, the same went for the musical works of Morita. But just how dismal was the music of Doji Morita? Let's explore the rest of their discography. Only one year following their debut, Doji Morita released Mother's Sky. This album saw many unique tracks, beginning with the subtle melancholy of a song titled Our Mistake, also translated to Our Failure. Under the sunlight filtering through the leaves of spring, I was such a weakling, bathing in your kindness, wasn't I? We got tired of talking and at some point fell silent. A hot plate on top of a stove burned red. This album presents the same themes of how brief and fleeting youth really is. Monita's dismay at their bygone youth is constantly present within the album, but certain songs present short outbursts in between. As if Morita is overwhelmed by these feelings and frustrated because of it. An example of this is the song Gyaku Kosen or Backlight. 
While each song in itself is not too harsh, listening to a Dolce Morita album in full can leave a very bitter taste in your mouth. As though you can feel the unhappiness, hopelessness, and yearning the artists felt as they wrote and performed these songs. Morita's 1977 release, titled A Boy, continued these themes. Beginning with the first track, Aoki Yorua or Blue Night. Spring is a phantom. The two of us are lost within a sad dream. Shall I, carrying on as we are, fall further into ruin with you? Can we go back? Can we return? Or shall I, carrying on as we are, sleep beside you a little longer? In my opinion, this album specifically captured a feeling of yearning and desperation, like a want, even possibly a need to just go back. The song Samishi Sobyo is a highlight of this album that showcases that. It's just capturing a moment where the speaker is lonely and trying to cope with their feelings. The lyrics are simple yet concrete. Pairing this with Morita's haunting vocals is an experience unlike any other. It was in 1978 that Morita performed songs for their first and only live album. This was in Tokyo at a church of all places. That church being the St. Mary's Cathedral in the Bunkyo Ward. While you may be picturing a small local church, I assure you it is not. The architecture is modern gothic. Really, as strange as it sounds out of context, this was the perfect setting for Morita's work. The insert in one of the vinyl releases shows the show itself, though I cannot find any actual footage. It's clear in these photos, however, that Morita's appearance is obscure, just like how it was on the album covers and press photos. You can't really see much of their face, if any really at all. The next original songs would come about two years later in 1980 in the album The Last Waltz. The next would come in 1982 with Nocturne, retaining the same dark themes but producing music at a slower rate. It was at this point where Morita seemed to be a little burnt out or unmotivated to create music like they did in the beginning. Though nobody knew if this was truly the case because nobody knew anything about this artist aside from what they chose to share. That being through music. This music did not falter in quality though, if anything, it continued to communicate loneliness and yearning in more unique ways. One track from The Last Waltz is a good example of this, its lyrics are disjointed. As though the speaker is slipping away. Other songs from this early 80s era share the same mood, the illicit heartache and an unpleasant seclusion, one that's almost sedating. Now, as a comparison, I'd recommend googling what's topping the Oricon charts in these years, the years that Morita was active, just to see the kind of artists that the mainstream liked. The big ones being names like Hiromi Go, Seiko Matsuda, and Candies. All of these artists are idols. Artists that sang love songs and upbeat pop. If you look up the lyrics of their songs, they're pretty tame, pretty happy, and sterile. The kind of stuff that can be applied to the majority of those listening, that being the majority of the Japanese public at the time. It was stuff people wanted to hear, not stuff that made them uncomfortable or solemn. Not saying that's a bad thing, but it was very different from Morita's music. Morita didn't do it for fame. They had a message and they wanted to be heard in their most genuine form. It was in 1983 that Doji Morita decided enough was enough and announced their retirement from music. This was directly following the release of their final album, 1983's Wolf Boy. And with that announcement of retirement, Morita performed one final live show. Seven albums in a total of only eight years, totaling in 64 original songs. Doji Morita sang about a lot of really personal things, the longing for youth, the feelings of failure, the acts of defiance they took part in with their protests and engagement with their friends. Despite the transparency, nobody ever got a look at their face or learned their real name. The listeners knowing so much about Morita without even knowing what they looked like or what kind of life they led beyond the stage. Many fans had speculated why they stopped making music. Did they become overcome by all the grief they sang about? Were they simply resolved and got all their feelings out so that they could maybe just move on and live life? Did they feel they no longer had an audience? 
Japan in 1983 was entering the luxurious bubble era. The Japan of this era was especially materialistic and this was only going to escalate as the decade went on. With that considered, those days of Morita's youth were truly long gone. Nobody knew where Doji Morita went following this. They vanished with no further information. If you watched part one of my video on the rise and fall of idol Noriko Sakai, you may already be briefed on the trendy drama trend of the early 90s. There was one trendy drama in particular that gave Morita mainstream recognition for the first time in their career. 10 years have passed and it's the year 1993. The drama was Koko Kyoshi or High School Teacher. It was written by Shinji Nojima, the very same man who took part in writing Noriko Sakai's best-known dramas. One being Under One Roof, which also aired in 1993. Now, unlike most trendy dramas of this time period, High School Teacher was quite a bit darker. As a matter of fact, it was initially pitched as an anti-trendy drama. The plot illustrated a battery of social taboos. This included inappropriate relations between students, teacher and student, and siblings. This drama was very controversial, but also immensely popular. During High School Teacher's initial airing, there was a great deal of buzz surrounding the finale as well as all the uncomfortable scenarios brought about within the course of the story. The finale itself is especially controversial and still debated upon today. I won't spoil it just in case anyone wants to watch this drama at some point though. High School Teacher is not an innocent or wholesome love story. It's very unlike dramas like Tokyo Love Story, Summer Story, or Under One Roof. The story of High School Teacher is a very sad one. A sad story that was beautifully complemented by the music of Doji Morita. That's right. While Morita gathered their own dedicated fan base throughout the late 70s and early 80s, the height of their career never occurred until a full decade had passed since their retirement. This was with the use of the 1976 song Our Mistake as High School Teacher's opening. Shinji Nojima was a huge fan of Morita's work and specifically wanted their music to be used in the drama. With the success and controversy of High School Teacher, Morita's music became popular on a mainstream level. Prior to the drama's release in early 1993, the music of Morita was not easily obtainable in record stores. By this time, their records were not selling well and had gone out of print. And typically, trendy dramas often picked music by artists who were popular currently. The choice of adding Our Mistake, a song that was 17 years old and relatively unknown at that point, was an unusual one. Following the influence of Nojima's drama, Our Mistake had seen its very first time on the mainstream Oricon charts through the drama's soundtrack and was praised as a hidden masterpiece. Morita's albums themselves were being produced once again for the very first time on CD, and a Best of album being released for the very first time as well. Despite the resurgence in attention on Morita, including a new generation of youths taken by this music, they did not appear again publicly, and they remained in retirement. The new fans, as well as the old, continued to speculate on who they really were and where they went. More so than ever. But still, no answers were found. It was another decade later, in 2003, when high school teachers saw a modernized remake. This one also featured that same Doji Morita song as its opening. Only, it was a little different. This opening was a re-recording, sung by Doji Morita themselves 20 years after retirement. This confirmed that Morita was alive and well in 2003. While they still did not make another public appearance, the last still being that final 1983 show, they came out of retirement to create one last recording. This once again caused a surge in attention on Morita, now with even more dedicated efforts to figure out who the person behind the glasses and thick hair really was. The internet was actively used by the average consumer by this point, and the intrigue was primarily hosted on Tuchan at this time. Fans were now able to dig up and share old magazine interviews and photos. Still, they never were able to track Morita themselves down and find any answers. Years went on and the mystery was never solved. Morita retained their privacy. That is, until the year 2021. Rei Nakanishi was a famous songwriter and musician. 
very well known for writing an abundance of Japanese pop music over the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and winning many awards for their work in the music industry. Though, in the 1990s, he decided to step away from music and begin writing essays and novels. Their final book was a biographical work that they requested to be released after their passing, found as a manuscript in their office a 2021 book titled Chi no Uta, or Blood Song. Now, what in the world does this have to do with Doji Morita? A great deal more than you may think. You see, according to this book, Doji Morita was Nakanishi's niece. This was something that was speculated upon a lot on internet boards, actually. Up until 2020 on Morita-related threads on 5chan, People on these boards had found public records, addresses, and death announcements that correlated to these theories. But nothing concrete ever came about to prove the theory once and for all. It was with this book that the hardship and strife of Morita's life was revealed. At least a piece of it. What was also revealed was their name, or rather, her name. Minobu Nakanishi. While Morita was ambiguous in their musical career and image, their voice was distinctly feminine. This wasn't a huge revelation, but a confirmation nonetheless. Morita's father was Rei Nakanishi's brother, a former pilot during the Second World War named Shoichi Nakanishi. Following the war, Shoichi had a great deal of PTSD as he survived various attacks. He had also founded multiple companies and a golf course at the war's end by loaning money from his brother Rei, but unfortunately managed them poorly and drove his family into poverty, resulting in a difficult upbringing for Morita. With nowhere else to go at one point, they reportedly moved in with Rei Nakanishi. Some kind of conflict between Rei and his brother ultimately led him to kicking the entire family out. Morita may have held disdain towards her father. This clash between generations was definitely seen during the university protests that Morita was engaged in in the late 60s. Rei Nakanishi claimed that Morita began singing in the underground scene in 1973. They were regular performers at live houses before receiving a record label offer. It was decided that Morita would hide her real name and connection to her famous uncle in order to maintain a holistic image that wasn't commercialized. Nakanishi's book also stated that Morita greatly feared having the negative connection of her father's business failures discovered as well. She feared receiving negative press for that reason. So, at its core, Morita really did want to only be known for her music. She wanted to make a name for herself organically and do things the way she wanted. What about her retirement, though? Did Morita quit making music because it was too much? Was she unable to continue her pursuits in a materialistic 80s Japan? The real reason is neither. Doji, or rather Minobu, wanted to marry and become a housewife. Turns out, during her private life, Morita had fallen for her manager a man named Adol Maeda, who actually was a friend of Rei Nakanishi. In 1983, Morita and Maeda decided to marry. Morita no longer wished to sing about her bygone past and the sorrows she endured. She decided to retire because she had a future to look forward to and a new life to live. Turns out, Doji Morita just wanted to settle down and become a housewife. And that's exactly what Minobu Maeda did. The two remained married in the decades that followed, buying a home in 1983. A home that 5chan users had their eye on prior to the release of Chi no Uta. Unfortunately, the reason this home came to the attention of internet users was the passing of Ado Maeda in 2010. Then, later on, the passing of a Minobu Maeda in 2018. Unfortunately, Doji Morita had passed away in 2018 at age 66. Nakanishi's book discussed this. Apparently, Morita was heartbroken when her husband had passed away eight years prior. She was incredibly lonely and remained in the home they purchased together back in 1983. It was in 2018 when she passed away from heart failure. They Nakanishi personally felt that she died from a broken heart. A couple years later, that same home was demolished. A new one now stands in its place. So, 
At long last, the mystery behind who Doji Morita was had been revealed. Somewhat. This revelation intentionally came about following the passing of Nakanishi, Maeda, and Morita. For that reason, Morita herself cannot come forward to clarify or confirm any details given within the book. We really don't know how much of it is actually true. The Japanese public never saw what Doji Morita looked like past their public disguise. Morita likely walked the streets of Tokyo on a regular basis without anyone having the slightest idea of who they were and what they contributed to Japanese music. Though, I think that's exactly how Doji Morita wanted it. But, what do you all think? Should Morita have come forward when her music saw widespread success? Would it have been any better if we never learned anything at all? Do you think it was right for Chino Uta to be published at all? Do you think all of it is entirely true? I'd love to hear what you all think. <laughs>